So I agree with you. There's one. Okay, we got one. one. There's our one. one. All right, is big change coming? Guys, you really need to acknowledge and start to adjust your communication Mm -hmm. channels to your customer. Okay, so there's one. What else would you say? This is the Strategy with Jason podcast with your host, Jason Jason Harris. Harris. All right, guys. Um, today I have uh, Lucy Lewis so the, from Canadian Auto Dealer. Right now we are here at the Ace Expo in Niagara Falls. Uh, Lucy, thank you so much for taking the time Absolutely. to uh, jam with me. Uh, for everybody out there that uh, doesn't, that don't know about you or how you kind of got in the industry, if you can kind of give us that origin story that is Lucy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I could go a long way back on Lucy, but I'll just say it's sort of the industry. Uh, so I come from a, a traditional radio and television uh, background uh, in business development and uh, was looking for a change. Have always been... Uh, sort of an automotive guy, uh, building race cars, racing cars, and and even on the uh, the uh, the traditional you know radio television side, dealers were always great to work with. You know, you know they're trying to drive you know up through their doors, and uh, well, traditionally radio and television they had money to to advertise, so they're good good people to talk to, and they're yeah. just kick ass guys. And uh, this opportunity with Canadian Auto Dealer came up, presented itself, and. Uh, uh, you know, for me, it was a really great opportunity because it married what I was already doing with traditional media sales, but, you know, reaching vendors that are also reaching dealers. So mm-hmm. it kept me connected with the dealership world, but in a different way. Uh, now, readers, uh, our readers are our dealers. That's so cool. I, I'm picking their brains about, you know, what's going on in the industry, and it's different from province to province, so it's great. No, I, I think where you are is pretty neat, and especially being, like, new to the business. I mean, you really kind of get this cool bird's-eye view of being able to consume a lot, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it, it just you guys are kind of this, this center point for just so much information, you know, in the industry. So uh, for people out there that, uh, that don't know, you know, uh, about what, you know, uh, Canadian Auto Dealer does. Can you just give them a little context there? Yeah, absolutely. So Canadian Auto Dealer is quite literally the voice of franchise dealers in Canada. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we're we uh, business partners with the CADA. Mm-hmm. Uh, so quite literally, we're the, the voice of dealers in Canada. We're completely uh, autonomous when it comes to editorial. Uh, so we speak to dealers about what's important to dealers, and we reach all 3,200 of them across the country. So uh, we have a pretty good finger on the pulse of what's going on in Canada, and, and we're always creating and curating content. So uh, it has to be relevant, it has to be timely, and, and I can't imagine how our editorial team pulls it together, but uh, we hear, you know, sp- speaking to vendors even today, mm-hmm. uh, you know, h- how, does this, how does this come together? And it's, it's events like this, when we get an opportunity to speak to dealers, we get an opportunity to speak to vendors, and really marry those two uh you know insights together yeah yeah no and, and i think it's cool because i've been consuming your guys' stuff for a very long well pretty much ever since i've been up here in canada mm-hmm. right and and um I, I do find i can't i can't imagine how difficult it is to just always be trying to take care of what's current now but then also trying to identify you know the content that's relevant for the future and it's just consistently always trying to provide value i mean look there, there has to be a reason that someone's going to flip it open and start reading and if there's just not value within within that, that magazine then there's just no reason to flip it open 200 percent and, and to double down on that we you know the the, the publication you know eight editions a year it, it's got to be challenging mm-hmm. and yeah. I, from a non-editorial standpoint I think they're magicians our editors yeah. and our, our, our team and then you look at the digital side of it and we deploy 52 weeks a year in you know digi- oh yeah 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 of course the content online too as so, well yeah and and, and Jason you're 100 percent right that that content has to speak to it has to be important it has to be relevant it has to be current yeah. because if not all credibility is lost and then then we we lose that audience there's a disconnect mm-hmm. and the interesting thing is you say you've been consuming it for 13 years you've been 13 years yeah here in Canada. Uh, yeah about 12 12 13 12, yeah and that, that's about the length we've been in the market in in that time we've never had a dealer say nope we don't want to receive this anymore so yeah i mean i think i was always kind of looking forward to it i mean even just at the dealership it would show up i mean it's big you can't miss it in the mm. first place right um you know you know what's funny it's funny i'm thinking about this i don't think i actually ever consumed the content online i always consumed it in its paper form which is really kind of odd for me because that's not normally the case it was just the the layout mm-hmm. and the imagery and the articles in it just being right there, it was right. just so much easier just to flip it open and just start consuming it. It's funny because it's the last frontier. Uh, yeah. And you think dealers, you, know, you work in a dealership, you've got 
200 emails in your inbox every single day that you have to try to get through? Yeah. Oh, yeah. At what, least. <laughs> what do I want to do if I have 200 emails in my inbox every day? I want to push myself away from the computer when I have something that, that I can use to consume information that isn't that screen. Sure. And it's funny because you look at dealers here in Canada, especially a little bit different in the U.S., but in Canada, I think the median age is like 68 years old for a dealer mm-hmm. principal. Mm-hmm. They're still they're like the last, the old guard that really want to dig into that, that you know, tactile, physical publication. But then we, we start talking to GMs that are getting it as well. And they're like, yeah, you know what? I love it. Somebody yeah, probably- it, it, it's not even, it's funny. It's just, it's one of those particular places where you guys have been able to provide so much value in the content that even though it's an older medium, we're still consuming it. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's funny because I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking kind of hard during the entire time that I've been up here and I've been in the industry. It's actually probably one of the very few <laughs> pieces of that medium that, we, that I would actually pick up and flip through. And the only reason I would have ever picked it up and flipped through it is because there was value. You know, and, and I think that's what that's great. So something we can actually talk about is content has to have value to the end user. And, and thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've been trying to say this for forever. And you're right. If there's no value, you're not going to pick it up. It's, it's anything we do. We have to provide value, whether it's us or whether it's a dealer or whether it's a vendor that's selling into dealers. That, that mm-hmm. value is, what's the value proposition? What, you know, what am I going to get out of it? And uh, it's funny that you know, there's this buzz around thought leadership and what can we do from a thought leadership standpoint. And everyone wants thought leadership because they want to mm-hmm. connect with their end, you know, their end audience uh, without a salesy message. But when you think about it, a, a trade publication has been providing thought leadership since, you know, the, the p- printing press was created. They, they need to take a little, you know, page out of your book. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, but, but no, the strategy that you guys have been deploying for all these years, dealers need to take that exact same approach. Is that the content has to have some freaking value. And it's not self-serving. I mean, don't get me wrong. You guys still have ads within the space because look, you gotta pay for the thing, right? You know, but it's not that the volume ever feels like it's out of ratio, you know? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the one of the the things that we take to heart as well, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we want to make sure that if if there's a page that is sponsored and, and you know with one of our partners is that that page is going to be offset by content that a dealer can consume and can can make you know informed decisions and, and look to see what's going to change their business in the future right for sure so th- that's the sort of the juxtaposition am i making that one is, that's a real word right uh, you, you literally you're asking the wrong person i okay, make well, up words all the time let's, oh, let's, okay. let's go with it right? austin is that a real word okay yes. sweet all right. um. <laughs> but but you think about it now. Now I've I'm, I've lost my train of thought because <laughs> it's juxtaposition. To me all right, but, all the time. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's uh, <coughs> it's one of those things where it, we can we can focus on what's relevant and current now, but we also have to you know look at what's going to happen. And as you know, things change in this industry like that, right? Just that fast. So we're looking at what's going to happen in twelve months, twenty four months, sixty months. Kind of similar to finance terms, but yeah. we're, we're trying to focus on those, uh, those trends and, and issues that are going to change because we're on, a, on the precipice of a massive change yes. in the automotive industry. In the industry, we're heading down a massive change, and, and I want to get into that, but I just want to just recap one more time because I really want dealers to take a look at this in, in, in their marketing efforts and in their strategies is that here is an, an, an older medium mm-hmm. all right, that has been able to maintain the... the you know, the time in which everything has gone just so far digital. But because of the value that that content brings, us as dealers still continue to consume it. All right. So in every single medium, no matter if you guys are doing radio, probably not TV, uh, but maybe. Um, no. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Any of your digital, everything, like we... we We can't just be throwing stuff out there. We have to maintain that ratio. And I implore you guys to go grab a copy of of your of the magazine because I know I used to keep mine behind my desk. Mm -hmm. All right, is is take a look through it, and you'll start to see that there's this ratio of value proposition through the content, and a ratio of ads that are placed there, you know, for a purpose. And 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 as a dealership, when you do that, unfortunately, I find a lot of dealerships and their strategies do nothing but ads and don't bring that value and the valuable content mm. uh, to to the consumer. So I, I think everybody should probably take a moment here, go grab that catalog and really kind of consume it for its strategy. I, I would agree. And and it just, it, it's interesting that, that you touch on, you know, the, the content because dealers are the biggest 
vaults of content. The content machines. I mean, there's so much freaking opportunity. It's insane. And who's who's most likely to consume that content? Somebody that just purchased a vehicle. Yep. They're in love with that vehicle. Sign them yep. up. Like it, it, you you look at some of the dealers that, that do technology sessions or what yeah. have you. And I, I don't like to use the Apple Store analogy, mm -hmm. but they have a pretty good mix. When people buy something, they invite them back at no charge to learn all about their shiny new doodad. Well, it's continuing and maintaining that relationship. Hundred percent. Right? If you can get and and if you can get somebody that just made a purchase in your dealership back to your dealership and want to come back to your dealership post sale yeah. regularly, they're. You don't have to worry about you know where they get, they're not price shopping at that point. They're not going to go no. somewhere else for their next vehicle. They're going to say, "Hey, this is this is my place. This is yeah. where I am. I'm going to yeah. be back." So every dealer just has to find the strategy and and the content that they create that makes them different, right? Hundred percent. And uh, yeah, I think you know, well, if if a, if one of their clients or prospects is inundated with a, "Hey, here's our finance offer. Here's our sale." Add, 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 add. It, it goes into it immediately gets picked up into the junk folder and it's 100%. gone. But if you're providing that content that is, you know, I want to I wanna know how I make my X thing in my car work. I don't know how heated seats work. Yeah, no, 100%. It's just, and I, I have dealership. It's funny because we literally had this conversation with the dealership the other day. And they're like, but, but Jason, we have a newsletter. <laughs> you have a newsletter. All right. Let's, let's deep dive into that newsletter for a second. All right. And it's just like. No, you don't have a newsletter. Like the newsletter itself is just a combination of ads, all right. With oh. with a recipe for chicken noodle soup. Uh, I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not. No, 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 no. I, I love the idea of a newsletter. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing. But again, if you're not coming, it, it it's creating content for your customers and audience needs, not your own needs. Absolutely. And I feel like that's probably been wanting been one of the the winning formulas for your the company that you work for is that they've just consistently done that for the last 13 years yeah you know and therefore they've just created this brand equity of that whenever that I mean look a dealer gets a buttload of emails but they also get a buttload of mail yes all right and I'm telling you like I would walk in the morning all right and you know right around almost exactly 9 a.m. my controller would come in they drop off the stack yep all right the rubber band around oh. it and it was like here's the stack and no different than what I would do at home I would go through and toss this stuff out you know and but every time that my Canada Auto Dealer magazine just mm -hmm. went to the side and then when I ever did have that moment in some cases weeks later but whenever I did have that one moment where it's like okay I'm gonna get to consume something I would consume it but that's just because there's so much value there well thank you oh, well look I mean I, I wouldn't say it if you know, it wasn't true, right? You guys have brain equity in my eyes. Um, now, with that said, and guys, after you take a look at, think about that from a strategic perspective. Let's talk about the future. Yeah. You know, there's a, like you said, there's a lot going on right now in our industry. There's a, <laughs> a lot of people are saying this, and a lot of people are saying this, and and we have you know, digital retailing out there. We have uh, uh, communication systems literally coming out of our wazoo. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's astronomical how many commu different communication systems and portals that we have out there. All right, and then there's, there's there's trainers and coaches that are coming at us. Then there's just there's just so much. But what are you guys seeing? Oh. There's well, first, it's just an exciting time. I yeah. think a really exciting time to be a dealer, uh, and there's a lot of trepidation to to not know what that next thing is, mm -hmm. and you know how do we create a strategy to you know go into the unknown. But I think it goes back to what dealers do and have always done. They're always the center of the community, mm -hmm. and the thing is change. Change is always going to happen, whether you want it or you don't want it. And I think the big thing is is being open and adaptive to change. And the model of you know selling one car to one family or two cars to one family may change in the future. But whatever the opportunity is, dealers are most well positioned right now to pick up whatever the trend is, whether it be you know uh, transportation as a service or you know fleet mm -hmm. management within uh, whatever those those opportunities are when it comes to autonomous vehicles and becoming a warehouse for autonomous vehicles, self-service and all that. Yeah, uh, we need to start having the conversation. Absolutely. At, at least just talk about what it's going to look like, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily that you guys have to go run out and start preparing for it, but at least just start having the conversation. Yeah, and it's not going to change. Like, this isn't going to be something that changes tomorrow. Yeah. But enough tomorrows add up and we're there, right? You know, 100%. It's, it's one of those things, if we don't have the conversation and and, and if deal, and it's, it's interesting, goes back sort of the deal 
dealer principle because I think there are dealer principles that have been in this industry for, it, it's funny, the last conference I was at, somebody said, I can't wait. You know, the day I feel old in this room is the last day I'm in this room, right? And it's kind of a, a thought. If you look around, there's the, the dealer population's a little bit older, but they're smart and they're great entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The general managers, they're the ones that came up and they're like the millennials of now from, you know, the, the Gen X age where they, they're open to the ideas of change and they know what it's going to be. They don't have as much skin in the game, but they know that the, the, the dealership world is going to change and they're yep. open to those ideas while still maintaining business today because you can't go all in on the future and forget about your customers and, and the day-to-day -day operations of what you have today. So I think the majority of the general managers are probably w more well positioned uh, within dealerships uh, to, to have those conversations and make those you know, sort of predictions of what's gonna happen. Well, and I think it's key that for any dealership out there, future-proofing your business is incredibly important and you do need to have a champion. Absolutely. You, you need to have a champion that's like, hey boss, I got this. All right, right. Let, me, let me consume it. Let me chew on it. Let me strategize about it. Let me think about it. Let me let me just work out the what if. All mm -hmm. right, you know it's like I got this. You know, because if you don't, then you know, owners, you're gonna have to do it yourselves. You know, it's just someone someone has to be responsible. All right, for the the uh, future strategies, and you know, and sometimes you're gonna need to shelf these strategies. Yeah, you know, absolutely. and you, but the cool thing is that you shelf them. When the day comes, you're gonna go right over to that bookshelf and you're gonna pull it right out and right? say, like, let's review this. And it's it's funny because you look at what dealerships dealerships are already doing that now and have been doing that for you know almost a hundred years. Like mm -hmm. they'll have a strategy, it doesn't work because it's too soon, and then it'll come out later, right? And it's it's not different. It's just the way the business is evolving is going to be sure. different. It may not be traditional sales. And even you look at at digitizing the showroom and and how. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the deal gets to the dealership. Mm -hmm. That's different. The process is different for your salespeople, for your F&I office, but it's not so different that we wouldn't recognize it. But yeah. If you have a strategy to say, hey, this is the way we do it now, and some people still want to do it this way. For sure. And this is the way it's going to be in 10 years because most people don't want to do it this way now. But that, that ratio is going to shift. So where do you see, I mean, like I said, there's change. And, and honestly, we're, I honestly would say that we are so... We are so due for some significant change. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a little mind boggling. I mean, we have some very, very old processes. We have, you know, ways of selling cars, ways of communicating with customers that haven't changed in some cases 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I, I had a gentleman the other day, a neighbor of mine, it's got this amazing 1952, I think it's an F100 pickup, you know, and like he has the original bill of sale. I looked at the original Bell of Sale. I'll tell you right now, there ain't a hell of a lot of difference between that original Bell of Sale then and today. No. Nope. You know, it's like very little. I mean, it's more Omvic stuff, a little more language, a little bit more liability. But it, that, look, that's, there, there really hasn't changed. So we're really, really, really geared for a lot of changes. Now, with that said, um, you know, you're in this great place where there's just this funnel of, of information is just flowing into your guys' business. Yeah, right? absolutely. What would you say the three biggest changes that are coming that dealerships need to prepare for? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I'm actually prepared to, to, to highlight no, no, that. No, I think everybody, look, and look I, I know you haven't been in the business for a long time, yeah. but you were just this, at this mecca, you're at this central point where all this, com all this information comes in. Well, a couple things. Being customer centric, which everyone always has been, sure. but the customers. Mm, no, they haven't. But we can talk about that. Fair, but, <laughs> but the customer's changed. Uh, that bill of sale hasn't changed, but the customer has. And one yes, of the things I, I picked up uh, at NADA this year, and it was uh, the customer journey was sort of the underlying theme. But one thing I had in a conversation was I was talking to somebody, and they said, listen, I'm not going to pick up the phone if my mom is calling me. Why in the world would I pick up the phone if a car dealer is calling me? But they, they have the phone in their hand, true. right? Yeah. And but, we can say the same thing about email. Like, right? Like... <clears throat> There was a time when email, hey, that's the that's the the end be all end all. Yes. And now it's it's just another thing that's in in the way of doing your. We we need it, but there's email that's important, and then there's email that, well, I'll get to this later, which usually means never. No, no, no. I agree with you. It's it's, it's dealerships, and I agree. This is a really big change that needs mm -hmm. to start happening now, is that we're still forcing our consumers to communicate with us in a way that they just don't normally do. Their, right. their usage of that form of communication is almost damn near gone, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know I'll, I'll give you, for example, on, on dealerships' websites, all right, there's always 
three or four things that are asked on every single form fill on every single dealership's website I've ever seen. It's first name, last name, phone, and email. Right? Would you fill that out? No. Right? Like, it's, it's crazy you even asked me for my email in the first place. Right. It's like, I mean, yeah, I, I, A, spam filters. Luck, you're, good luck if the email even gets to me in the mm-hmm. first place. Then if it does get to me, I triage the crap out of my emails. You know, it's like, in fact, actually, I have my assistant that will triage my emails. And then once it's done, then I go through and do another level of triage right. through it. I mean, there has to be some significant value for that. And also, it's just it's the speed of communication. I guarantee you it will take me 24 hours, 48 hours to respond to an email. Mm -hmm. And if I do respond to an email, it's because it's like there was some value for me to respond to it in the first place, right? Um, That's my typical form of communication. Like for me, it's like the totem pole of communication, right? If you want to get a hold of me in five minutes, you DM me on LinkedIn. Yeah. I I live on LinkedIn, all right? Um, Within this 10 or 15 minutes, you can DM me on Instagram or Facebook. No, I actually, you know what's crazy? And, and I tell people this and they think that it's, it's, I actually have dealer principles that will communicate with me over Instagram and Facebook DM. They won't text or call, but they will actually messenger me. That's wild. But you know what? It, it's, it, but then, and then I give them a hard time. I'm like, look, your comfortable place of communications is in this space, yet your website is still asking for an email address. Yeah. Like fill out this paper and then get a carrier pigeon to drop it off at our front door. It's it's ridiculous, right? I, and even text messages. I don't respond to text message as fast as I do some of these other forms. It's mm-hmm. so faster. You'll get a text respond from me in the 30 minutes to an hour, you know, but it's just like it's not it, for me it's just a it's a priority totem pole. And consumers have it the same, same it, as well. It's the same way. And and think from a dealer, why are they not looking at their business the same way they would purchase from their business, right? Yeah, we, we're not customers. We don't, we, don't, we don't act like customers. Right, but we're all customers every... I know, we, we, I agree. We leave our job, but we're, we're all consumers. We're all customers. Mm-hmm. Just because we're a car dealer or we're, you know, we sell shoes or whatever it is, let's say print media, it doesn't matter. We're all consumers even though we have a different hat. We have a different lens. And I think that actually makes us better. Yeah. And we should be better at understanding the consumer journey yep. and, and the way to communicate with them because ultimately this is our job. We're supposed to be the, be- the some of the best in the world at this. We yeah. sell things for a living. Yeah. Why can we not find the process? We, we buy things. We know how we like to buy things. Why don't we you know, factor that into our decision making when we sell things? Yeah, it's just like, it, I, I agree with you. It's just that you know, dealerships have to rethink their communication process mm-hmm. out to their customers, right? I mean, I have a handful of dealerships right now that um, have installed Facebook Messenger directly on their website, which, by the way, you guys can do, and it's totally free. Um, it, 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 they engage. Mm-hmm. They've found a much higher engagement rate with Facebook Messenger than they did with live chat, than they did with phone calls, than they did with, I mean, even astronomically more than phone calls or emails. But it's just like, it, it, it's, it's just a matter of, it can, it's, it's as simple as changing our website form from just asking the person, how the hell would you like to communicate? Ask, giving choice. You know, Just ask them. You're funny. You give somebody a choice and they generally make one. Yeah. You know what the funny thing is? It doesn't actually, it wouldn't even change the amount of time. Because remember, there's four fields, right? Mm-hmm. First name, last name, phone number, email. So let's just say first name, last name. How the hell do you want to be communicated by? Yep. And then fill in the blank. What's your handle? What's your phone number? Yeah. What's your email? What's your text number? What's your, you know. Right. So and any website provider out there listening to this right now, um, you can reach out to me. It's absolutely, you can take this idea and run with it and let me know if you do it. I think, um, it's, a, I think it's a great way to go, right? Give, give consumers a choice and they'll make a decision. Yeah. And, yeah. and you'll see, the, the, the funny thing is to go back to Facebook is what, there's 30 million Canadian Facebook users? Yeah, here in Ontario, 62% of the entire province has a Facebook account. And do you know what the, the the largest group of that, you know, growing group is? It's an older demographic. It is. And it is an older demographic. Who has money to buy cars? The older demographic. Who doesn't have to worry about non-prime and, and getting older. finance? No, I, I agree. It's just, it's just, and that's what it is. It's it, so I agree with you. There's one. Okay, we got There's one. one. There's, There's our one. one. All right, is big change coming, yeah, guys? You really need to acknowledge and start to adjust your communication mm-hmm. channels to your customer. Okay, so there's one. What Absolutely. else would you say? Ah. Uh, there's a couple more. And so yeah, I might actually have three. Okay, Second cool. one, I would say um, you know, take care of, you know, the, 
I, I want to say staff and dealers want to do this, but there's sometimes a perception where it's not the easiest industry to, to operate in from a sales standpoint to move your way up. But if yep. you take care of your staff, you like look at churn yes. oh, in a dealership. Churn. Churn, churn, churn and churn is the worst, right? And you figure, let's say modestly it costs 25 grand per employee that you lose. Yep. Because time invested in them, the money invested in them to train them, and then lost productivity while you're training somebody new. Let's say the average dealer does 10 sure. a year, right? There's $250,000 in churn, what dealer is going to say no to $250,000 that they find in fixed ops or in sales or in the business office? They're all going to say, yes, give me that. Of course. It's it's crazy that, and I agree with you. It's like, I start thinking of these spaces we have to change and they're like, they're like, I picture like a bubble and it's like growing and growing and growing. Eventually it's just going to have to pop. All mm-hmm. right. The way that we are managing, the way that we are coaching, the way that we are training our staff that shit's got to change. Yeah, and and it, you know what's it's because that's what creates the turn. It is. And and if it's not an environment, and the other thing you look at some, some dealers will do this. And it, it, you know what, not just dealers. This is I think across any sales industry is that the leading yeah. salesperson, you know what, you've been in this role, you've been great. You, you can sell 25 cars a month. You're great. You're, you know, a great salesperson. You're going to make a great sales manager. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> But I hate the, that. I know where you're going. Right? right? And yeah, then yeah, yeah. You look at sales manager, A, you're taking your highest producing salesperson off the floor. Yep. So now you're taking a revenue hit because they're not immediately effective in, you know, in selling vehicles. They're taking them out of that. And now you're putting them in charge of people. And people are definitely not cars. It's entirely different roles, right? entirely different talents, entirely different day-to-day activities and behaviors like I agree with you I, I in fact actually I just had this conversation with a dealership and they were hiring people and I'm like they're looking for a new manager and they asked me like Jason do you know anybody any of the dealerships I'm like uh, no and I don't think you should be looking at any of the other dealerships you know for people that are moving around mm-hmm. you need that that managerial that that position is an insanely different skill set than it is in sales. You need to go hire a manager, not a glorified salesperson. 200%. And somebody from, they don't even have to be in the industry. No, actually, I don't think they should be. Right? You, I you really don't. Some, you get somebody that's a great people manager from another service industry, you can train them. Anybody can learn automotive sales. 100%. So a manager needs to know how to manage the process and let the process manage the people, mm-hmm. all right? And and they need to be just process monsters. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not necessarily something that we've always been super, super good at. So I, I implore people to look outside the industry, you know, for, for that type of position. You will see, a, I guarantee you will see a much higher ROI if you at least start looking outwards. Not saying you have to, but I'm just saying look. Yeah, and it, it opens up uh, a world of opportunity, right? Because you're not mm-hmm. feeding back into that system that, you know, if, if what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and yep. expecting different results, right? I would say if, if you take a kitchen manager out of a restaurant mm-hmm. and you put them in charge of a sales team, they know... They will crush it. Absolutely. I'm okay. telling you right now, they'll crush it. In fact, right? actually, I know someone who just did that. Um, yeah, I, I literally just had lunch with him last week, and it's exactly what it was. He right. was a head chef, ran a whole crew, and you want to talk about stress. I mean, high end restaurant, head chef, like they're all, you're managing a team in a very stressful environment. And where he is right now, managing a sales team, he's crushing it. Well, well think about it in a restaurant, you screw up, you kill someone. Yeah, in fact, yeah, yeah, it can, I've seen the fights. Right? Yep. It can be a thing. So, you know, it, that's just a, and, and uh, I think I know who you're talking about. So uh, <laughs> awesome, awesome uh, setup. But yeah, it, it's any industry. Restaurant mm-hmm. would be one, you know, somebody that runs a hotel, a, any service industry, uh, you know, those people coming from a different, and different perspective is, is what this, this industry needs to an extent. Like yep. Car guys are car guys, and, and, and dealers always, you know, they're going to know the industry best. But at the same time, you get somebody with a fresh perspective, and that's how things change. Yeah. And that's, you look at technology uh, companies coming into this industry right now, and they're like, well, why do I have to do this this way? Like, no, we can do this completely differently. And you look at some of the companies coming in and, and providing services to dealers, and it's like, yeah, why, why have we not been doing this our entire life? I, I agree with you. And, the, and, and staff is so important because really at the end of the day, it's your differentiating factor. All right. You know, there's 30 Nissan dealerships in the greater Toronto area or something, 27, I don't know. So, there, there are a lot of Nissan dealerships in the greater Toronto area. It seems like I can just drive a few blocks and run into another Nissan right. dealership. All right, look, you guys all sell in the exact same car. 
Okay, you're also on the exact same service. Okay, you're all going to be within a few bucks of each other, really, at the end of the day. All right, there has to be a differentiating factor, and that differentiating factor is going to be your staff. So I completely agree with you. You know, this is another bubble that is going to have to burst. We're really going to have to spend time in developing out our staff. And a lot of that for me is I, I categorize this into four spaces. Um, I categorize this into training. Um, training has to do with actually uh, developing out the uh, efforts, all right, that, that are required to complete a process. Then I find that there is development, mm -hmm. all right, um, kind of developing out those efforts so that we get better performance out of them because the first series of processes or efforts won't be the last one. No, that's right. Right. Third is coaching. All right. You got to be one on one with your staff and really kind of coach them from an individual level how they're going to continue to better. And then the fourth one, and I find this to be actually one of the most important ones, is actually team development. Yes. Taking them out of your dealership and generating, creating a team. Yeah. It's it, it, because there's a. If, for a hundred years, has been competition. They're, yep. they're, the, they're the number one salesperson at the top. They, you know, they always want to be at the top. But that doesn't really breed a customer-focused environment, now, does it? it no, it, no, it, no. Bre it breeds a well. I'm going to go out and I'm going to sell my 35 cars this month, mm -hmm. and I don't care if you sell any to the other sales staff. Of right? course, they, like, of I'm going to sell mine, and I'm in it for me. But from a dealer principal, they're thinking I want to sell all the cars. Right. Yep. I don't care who sells them. I want to sell seventy. I don't want to sell thirty-five. Yep. And it is. It, that, it's, it, it's managing your team through competition, and it's a horrible thing to do. It's it's not a it's not the way to. Uh, it, I, I shouldn't say it's not the way, but it will not be the way going forward that a dealer is going to. That's gonna where succeed, I think there's going right? to be some change. Great. All right. So we got number two. Number three. What are you thinking? Finance structures. Ooh, I like that. And and one thing, there's a stat. Uh, between 30 and 40 percent, and from a franchise dealer standpoint, mm -hmm. 30 to 40 percent of deals coming in now are uh, not prime. They're non-prime, sub-prime, yep. near-prime, and I don't think franchise dealers have typically done that very well in the past because it's always been about selling new cars, uh, and then OEs giving them you know stair-stepping programs like, yep. hey, we'll sell a new car if you sell a hundred, we'll give you you know here's the bonus structures, and it, it, it's really alienating 30%, 40% of the, the business and really high margin business. Yes. Because if you've got, every dealer has pre-owned vehicles that they can they can sell. 100%. And what they're missing, and it, it, sure, it's a challenge because non-prime is more of a challenge than somebody that's coming in with sterling I don't credit. Like, I don't like the word challenge. What it is, it's just, let's just say what it is. It's more work. You're right. right. It's it not a challenge. It's, it's, it's really not. It's just more work. It okay? is more work. The F&I managers like to use this stupid word called a challenge. No, 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 no. It's just more freaking time. It just, that's all it is. it is. It just takes more time, but you know? What happens when that... So it used to be, what, two non-prime uh, customers going into a franchise dealership a month. Now it's probably more like 20 or 30 a week. It, it can be. Right? It, it, it can be, it can be quite a few. And it's just like we have to have strategies in place on how it is. We have to understand that there are multiple levels of non-prime. Right? I like to call it, uh, there's a subprime, there's... Subprime. So There's subprime. So um, you know, right? And you have to kind of decide as a dealership where do you want to play, mm -hmm. uh, because you don't want to be jack of all trades and master of nothing. All right. It's like just kind of decide where you where you want to play. You know, and you know, and you're talking, you know, that that, that first subprime area could just be just literally can be a few points over what prime is in the first place. You right. Know? So you're talking about you know six, seven, eight, nine percent, right? And then you go to subprime, and that can be anywhere between. 10 to 15 mm -hmm. points, right? And you get to subprime, and it, it can get pretty hefty. Mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about 19 to sometimes 27%. Yeah, credit card percentage. You know, interesting. Yeah, it is. It's right. It's what it is. But it's, it's not a big deal. It's just it's a liability factor. It's just we just have to calculate that. Yeah, out. what's but the risk? You have to have a strategy for every single one. You know, you, you got to take the time to have the conversation. You're right. And and I think in the long run, with those strategies, dealers that, that hammer out where they're going to play in that, because let's face it, with the way uh, consumer debt is going, that, that, that number of 30% is only going to climb. I agree. It's right. not going to get smaller. It's not. And, and, you know, 
the the push for new cars if you had told dealers in canada 10 years ago that they you know we we would contract from 2 million to 1.9 million new units a year they would laugh and say that's incredible i don't even have to sell pre-owned like this is the best thing in the world but now that it's happening the sky's falling so they've got to find revenue and this is a huge piece of revenue is a they're i love how they say the sky's falling it's not really falling it's just this is we actually run in we have vehicle cycles if you looked Mm -hmm. historically all right that we typically run a, a four to five year of prosperity, and then we run a flat time and with sometimes a slight dip. And then a couple of years of that, or sometimes a few years of that, we'll go right back into another four or five year of prosperity. Which is, and everyone, that's the thing, everyone's happy and the good times are never gonna end yeah. until they end. And then it's like, well, we're never gonna get out of this terrible time, how do we? And then that's what forces uh, a dealer to find you know, a strategy that's going to make them successful in those four or five years, right? And it's having the foresight to know that they're coming, right? As soon as you start to see a downturn. Preparation. Preparation. Being proactive. Yes. We're just going to say, okay. Yeah, I know a lot of people go say, Jay, you know, it seems like you're just always kind of picking on us dealers a lot. It's, hey, guy, I'm not picking on you. I just, I have high expectations for you guys, and I want to see a win. So if it ever feels like I'm dumping on you a little bit, it's not. I'm just kind of pushing you along, okay? And you know what? We need to be more proactive. I, I just, I can't stand how our industry, I mean, when people talk about, hey, give, give, use a few words to describe dealerships, all right? Reactive is one of the most commonly used words to describe dealerships. Absolutely. That's got to change. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and, and to go back to, you know, the, the, it shouldn't be about negativity because dealers are probably the best entrepreneurs in the world. True. Yeah. You know, they, they've got a massive amount of overhead. They're juggling a thousand balls. They're, they're, there are very few people that could do what dealer principals and, and, and those in senior management roles in a dealership I couldn't do it. Yeah, I, no. I don't know a lot of people that are outside of you know in those roles that could do it. So, a massive amount of respect. They give back to their communities. They, they are the pinnacle, you know, business people. Oh yeah. But for us, it's our job to help guide them. Like these are the things that are coming. Stop being reactive. Yep. Look at and and I think part of the the process, part of the part of the 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 thinking now is that dealers are so involved in their business. Mm-hmm. That they're looking at the day to day of you know how are we going to get through and not looking you know at their business and working on their business. They work in it to get through the day to day. But but if they start shifting and working on their business, you know, taking an outsider's a, even if they look at themselves as consultants in a business that they're operating, they'll see hey these are the trends. Let's step back, see what's going to happen, and let's strategize so our business is successful until you know we're ready to do the next thing 100 percent, absolutely right. absolutely no and, and look it all comes down to just it's creating those strategies mm. it's like being prepared being proactive it's like you know uh, you need to be talking about these strategies out in advance and maybe you shelf them you document the strategy you put it on the shelf and when that time comes you, you can deep dive into it right but you know to to, to get to start talking about subprime at a time when you should have been talking about subprime 12 months ago yeah. and start planning and strategizing for it, you know, then you get this reactive version of what it should look like. And it's not pretty. And, and you can't strategize when you're, when you're on the back foot, right? Yeah. It's like if you're in a boxing match and you're getting the hell beat out of you, <laughs> what, true. What, what do you do? You cover up and you protect yourself. Yep. But you don't go offensively and, and, and try to find a, a way to win. Yep. You just protect what you have. And you don't grow a business by protecting, only protecting what you have, right? No, 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 100%. Like, I, I think that's, that rounds up our, our, our top three. And I think that makes a hell of a lot of sense, guys. We're, we're sense. seeing the change in financing. We're seeing the change in consumer credit. All right. It's like, if you guys haven't had these conversations, all right, you need to have these conversations and you need to develop out a strategy. You need to know where within that subprime space that you're going to want to play in. Um, hey, Lucy, thank you so much for taking the time to, to come jam with me, man. I, I really, really appreciate it. For anybody out there that would like to connect with you and learn a little bit more about what you guys do, what's the best way to connect with you? I'm on LinkedIn, uh, uh, James Lucy Lewis, or uh, just uh, pick up the magazine. Uh, look in, I think, page five. Page You've five. got all my contact information <laughs> in the, in the uh credits of a Canadian auto dealer. But uh, yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity. This no, is, man, uh, man, I really appreciate it. I would do this every week. I like thinking. <laughs> it's it's great. fun. I told you. This, this is the best right? in the world. Anybody else that watches these, <laughs> sit in this seat. It is a good catbird seat to sit in. It's fun. Yeah, it's Thanks awesome. again, man. I appreciate okay. it. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>